the announcement, the brain turns. Is my video on? No. Now you are. Hi. Um, hi, brain turns. Thanks for all your support these days. You guys have been amazing. I just wanted to let you know that we're, first of all, it's National Neurosurgery Month. And we, I know, crazy. We are launching a Instagram competition that I think you guys will be really interested in. And I encourage as many of you guys as you can to participate. Um, I will post all of the instructions and the rules on Instagram, but just a, as a quick overview, to enter the competition, you need to follow us on Instagram. It's LHH underscore neurosurgery. Um, create an Instagram post, which can be anything from a video to a picture to a TikTok, shout out Lauren, um, and ensure that you tag us and Ulari Films and hashtag Lennox Hill on Netflix. So the post should focus on Lennox Hill on Netflix, whether it's showcasing something that you learned from the show or that you learned from Brain Turns, um, or just using your artistic abilities or creating an illustration of the doctors. You guys can get creative. I think you can create an image or a video and the winner will receive an amazing swag bag of all things Lennox Hill on Netflix that are signed by Dr. Booker and Dr. Langer. So you definitely don't want to pass up this opportunity. There's a lot of really cool things you can win. Um, yeah, the instructions will be posted in the Facebook group as well. Um, but yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. But I highly encourage you to participate. It's a great opportunity for you to use your creativity and statistic abilities to um, end up winning something really cool. Uh, am I allowed to win? No. <laughs> and you right, you might fine. even win a special date with Randy in Brooklyn. I'm shadow. So definitely, definitely do your best to try and win. All right, Neela, take it away. Thanks so much, Flora. This is uh, actually really exciting. It's going to be a lot of fun. So can't wait to see what everyone posts. Me too. Hey, Danilo. What's up, Randy? Hey, Josh. I'm good, man. Thanks for coming along. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation again. I'm happy to be yeah, part of it. Absolutely. These Guys. things are always greatly informative. So we're going to, uh, Dr. Silva is going to talk to us today about vestibular schwannomas as part of our virtual NeuroLonk um, OR experience. And so, uh, you know, as, a, as a, an expert in skull base, as well as, you know, skull top and neuro-oncology, um, and endoscopic surgery, you know, he's got a, a great experience with these tumors, it's gonna be very informative. Um, so stay tuned, we have a lot to talk about. I'm gonna be jumping in and out, Daniela, so we'll have a, we can have a discussion about this towards the end too. All right, thank you, man, no worries Thanks, at all. Thanks, <clears throat> Hello, everybody, again, Danilo Silva here. Uh, for the ones who didn't see my previous, presenta my previous presentation, I am the director of neurosurgery at Phelps Hostel in Sleepy Hollow, that's Chester. I'm also faculty of the Department of Neurosurgery at Lenox Hill. Okay, so I basically represent the, the expansion of Lenox Hill Neurosurgery to the Westchester area. And that's what we're trying to, to bring to this area here in New York, the excellence in patient care, the expertise, and, and the attention to detail type of mentality, the inspirational, uh, uh, everything that Lennox Sudner Surgery represents. So these are my social media active links. I have LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Please follow me. I'm happy to help anybody in anything in any endeavors that you're planning for your life. I have a, a little bit of a history about myself here. So today we're talking about the stiloschwanomas. We're gonna. This is a little bit of an outline of our presentation and we'll go over an introduction. We'll I'll tell you about how we classify them, what are the treatment options, and then we'll finish with some conclusion and some conclusions, basically some inspirational thoughts uh, that you can use for your life and everything that you're doing, okay? So I come from Brazil. I come from Recife, which is right there in the corner of Brazil. Uh, it's uh, one of the most beautiful cities in Brazil. 
And I came to the U.S. in 2011. I did research fellowship here in New York at Cornell for a couple of years, and I went to Boston. I did another uh, six months of research there at Brigham. Uh, then I moved to Cleveland, spent four years there as a clinical fellow in functional surgery, neurosurgical oncology, and skull based surgery. So I basically am kind of an all around brain tumor surgeon. And now I have the pleasure to be working here in New York with the Lennox Hill folks and also here at Phelps. Here we have a, a really nice picture of where Lennox Hill is. Upper East Side, really nice area in New York. Whenever you're here, for the ones who don't know the area, it's a really, uh, really great place to go for restaurants, bars, lounges, and so forth. And this is the crew, guys that really gave me this opportunity here. I'm really happy to work with Dr. Langer, Dr. Bukvar, Dr. Alice, Dr. Ciroli, and Dr. Ortiz, Mitch Levine. And this is one of my favorite pictures, uh, me, Randy, and, and Deepak, who recently joined us. And Randy has done an amazing job. I wanted to, to uh, big shout out for him. It's an amazing job with brain interns. It's a wonderful, it's like a movement now. It's, it's really a historical thing in terms of educational experience and so forth. I'm also uh, the director of neurosurgery here at Phelps Hospital, which is in Westchester area in Sleepy Hollow. Okay, it's a very nice area to visit as well. Beautiful place. So what are vestibular schwannomas? Vestibular schwannomas, they are uh, a fairly common, okay, tumor in the skull base. They account for 80% of the intracranial tumors and 30% of the posterior fossa tumors. So in the life of a brain tumor surgeon, this is something that you see on a basically, on a like a monthly basis, you always see one patient here and there in a big practice, you, you see this type of case even more often. It is the most common tumor in this area that we call the cerebral pontine angle. It represents 80% of the tumors in that area, followed by meningiomas and epidermoid tumors, okay? In the vast majority of the cases, these are histologically benign tumors. They are slow growing. They grow on average 0.2 to 2 millimeters a year, which is a slow growth pattern. And they most frequently, they originate from the intracanalicular part of the vestibular nerve. Uh, in this picture here on top, I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, arrow here, but it usually orin originates from the vestibular nerve, which is one of the nerves that is in charge for your balance and so forth, okay? Uh, the classical triad of symptoms are hearing loss, which happens roughly around 90% of the cases, some degree of hearing loss. Vertical ataxia, meaning balance problems, uh, disequilibrium, happens in around 50% of the cases, and tinnitus. Tinnitus is that very unpleasant ringing sensation in your ears, and it's usually unilateral, which happens in, in roughly about 80% of the cases. Uh, the cerebral pontine angle we were talking about, it's this location in the brain, okay, in the skull base, that's where the tumor rises. These are some anatomical pictures from the section of a very important anatomy book in neurosurgery called Roden, which was a great neurosurgeon at the University of Florida. And he basically spent his life dedicating himself to neuroanatomy, surgical neuroanatomy. And I just wanted to give you guys an idea of, of where we go when you're removing these tumors. So you have here on top some, an artist rendition from another book, <clears throat> from the same Rodham's book. And you see here is where the tumor would be located. It's close to a bunch of very important vessels and arteries and nerves. You can see what we call the lower cranial nerves, very important arteries in the area. And it is a very uh, uh, important real estate to work around. And it requires a lot of uh, training and a lot of patience and dedication to be able to, to operate on a tumor in this area. Okay. In terms of classification, the most important classification, just for you guys at this point to understand, 
is that vestibular schwannomas occur in two genetically and pathologically different forms. Uh, <clears throat> most of them, they are sporadic, okay? And it's usually unilateral, like this picture here on the top, uh, in like roughly 95% of the cases. So the vast majority of, majority of these tumors, they happen in a sporadic fashion around the fourth or to fifth decade of life, okay? But there is a different type of vestibular schwannoma that is associated with neurofibromatosis type two. These tumors are usually bilateral. <clears throat> they are basically always bilateral. Bilateral schwannomas like this is pathognomonic for neurofibromatosis type two. It's a mutation in the chromosome 22, and it is usually happens in younger age, okay, around 20, 30 years old. That's the, <clears throat> when these tumors present in these in the NF2 type of scenario. And a good and simple classification to understand is the one that it's based on size. And this is important for surgical decision making. And that's one of the things that I use myself in my practice when I'm talking about, when I'm thinking about recommending treatment. I think if you were here for my previous uh, presentation on pituitary adenomas, I think a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, one of the things I always like to emphasize when I'm giving talks about anything is that you have to know the natural history of the problem, okay? It is more important for you to be a good doctor than for you to be a great surgeon. We are all doctors. If you don't know the natural history of a problem, you won't be able to recommend the best treatment options, which sometimes may not be even doing anything. Sometimes you just watch, you know, just observe. A lot of things in neurosurgery can just be a watch there, actually. And so tumors that are period intracanalicular, just inside the internal auditory canal, like you see here in this arrow, we call T1. When it's intracanalicular or extramial, when it's, uh, it's uh, we call T2, okay? It's feeling the cerebral pontine angle. We will say it's a T3A. If it's touching the brainstem, which is this structure here, if the tumor comes out and touches the brainstem, and then it is a T3B. The T4s, they compress the brainstem, like this picture here on the bottom. And if it dislocates the brainstem in the fourth ventricle, then you call it T4B, okay? So basically T1, T2 are small tumors inside the, the, the internal auditory canal and the meatum, uh, and maybe going a little bit outside the meatum, but the, the T3 and the T4 tumors, they are big, usually much bigger tumors, and T4 being the ones that are really causing mass effect in the brainstem. Okay. When you're talking about vestibular schwannomas, we have uh, the same treatment options than we usually have basically for every, every brain tumor. So in this type of benign tumors, usually we don't deal with chemotherapy. So basically the options here are observation, microsurgical removal of these tumors, and then radiation therapy. Radiation therapy comes in two flavors. You can do stereotactic radio surgery, which is a focus type of radiation, which is usually applied in a single fraction, in a single session, okay? Or you can do fractionated radiation. We call fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy, okay? Which is in multi multiple sessions. These days, you can also do stereotactic radio surgery in multiple sessions, but this is an advancement recent advancement that you don't need to focus on. But the goals of treatment are to preserve neurological function, mainly in the cranial nerve functions related to the facial nerve, which is close to that area there, okay? Provide good quality of life, safe tumor removal, and also to stop tumor from growing. Those are the basically, the base treatment, <clears throat> treatment goals for every brain tumors, right? That's, that's what we wanna do as neurosurgeons. Every neurosurgeon is a functional neurosurgeon. We are here to preserve function. We are not in the era of neurosurgery that it's just, that the goal is just to 
save a life that is behind us. We want to preserve neurological function with good quality of life. That's our goal. <clears throat> and as I told you before, some tumors in, in nerve surgery, in skull based surgery, definitely the psilocybinoma applies to this, to this uh, rationale. Some tumors you can just watch. This is a good paper here just to emphasize that we have literature that if you have a small psilocybinoma, we call it a T1 from that classification, or even a T2, or a small one that is just inside the canal, okay, depending on the patient's age, you can just watch it. Sometimes some of the, these tumors, they don't grow. Just because it was growing at some point, it does not mean that it's gonna grow forever and get really big. So as conclusion, for example, this patient, this patient, this paper here, the solution normal growth occurs within the first five years after diagnosis in a limited number of tumors, <clears throat> primarily in tumors with an extra meator extension. Okay, so mainly if the tumor is intracanalicular and small, you can just watch and maybe these patients will do well and they won't require anything, any, any type of, of treatment. We always think about the hearing, functional status of the patient, okay, if the tumor is growing or not, and we use this clinical information to make our decision, uh, to base our decision-making process, okay? Another type of treatment is microsurgical removal. We can use different surgical approaches to the skull base to get to that area that I showed in the beginning, the cerebellum pontin angle, and remove these tumors, or to go inside the internal auditory canal and remove the tumor from inside the canal, okay? And one of the approaches that we use is translabyrinthine approach. I'm gonna show some pictures of that, which is uh, usually used when, when the patients, they don't have any hearing function that is used so anymore. Number two here, this green dot, when you go translabyrinthine, you're assuming that you're gonna cause the patient hearing um, deficit, complete hearing loss forever. So you only use this approach if the patient is not, has no hearing function in that ear anymore. You can use a middle fossa approach, which is also as a translabyrinthine approach, good for small intracanalicular tumors, but the middle fossa approach, you can preserve hearing, which is this number three here, the blue dot here, this blue square. Middle fast approach is also a skull based approach that you can use for small intracanalicular tumors that you are trying to preserve hearing. And the most traditional approach for this is the suboccipital retrosigmoid approach, which usually we use for tumors that are going into the CPA, okay, the cerebellum pontine angle. That's the most traditional approach used by most neurosurgeons to remove larger, larger tumors. And just a quick, uh, so you guys have an idea of what translabyrinthine approach is. Usually that's how we position a patient or a patient should maybe be in lateral position as well, but it's an incision right behind the ear, okay? And after doing the dissection, you get to the posterior temporal bone and <clears throat> you get to where the tumor is. Right here, you can see below. This is just a artist's rendition about the anatomy there. And there's no point for you to focus on the detail of the anatomy at this point for you, but I just wanted to show that by doing this translabyrinthine approach, you're going through the structures in the temporal bone and, and in the ear that will cause you complete hearing deficit, deficit. So if the patient has functional hearing, we never use this approach. But if they don't and the tumor is small and you can remove this approach, this is a very good approach. The middle fast approach, that's a good picture here of how we do it. We do a small incision right there in the temporal area and we, after doing a small craniotomy in the temporal bone, we can approach small intracanalicular tumors with the goal of preserving the hearing function on that side, okay? And the most common used approach when tumors are big, extending into the cerebral pontine angle is the suboccipital retrosigmoid approach. 
these are the approaches that I have more experience with. Okay, and that's kind of the view that you have. You make like an incision also behind the ear a little bit bigger. And once you dissect here on the right and on the corner here, you can see when you get to the cerebral pontine angle, the tumor is gonna be in this location here. <clears throat> As in this picture number letter D here, you can see where the tumor would be in relation to the facial nerve, to the low cranial nerve that are in the 9, 10, and 11, and 12. So these are all structures that you need to preserve. The fifth nerve is on top of it. These are all structures that you need to preserve in order to have a good, good quality of life after surgery. <clears throat> Just an example of a case that we did together, me and Randy and Deepak at Lenox Hill. Some time ago, this was a young gentleman, 30 years old, who presented with balance problems and, and hearing loss, okay? And he had this tumor here on the right side, as you see a big tumor that is pushing on the brainstem. And as that classification that I showed you, you see that the fourth ventricle, which is this area here, is displaced. So we would classify this as a T4B. So for every tumor that is big in a young patient, that is pushing on the brainstem, usually recommend surgery. So this is our surgical approach, the incision. <clears throat> and on the top, you see the pre-op images. On the bottom, you see the post-op images. We were able to <clears throat> achieve a very good resection. The patient did really well. And I'm actually seeing him next week for, for follow-up. His facial nerve is good. His facial nerve function is very good because we use during surgery, you see these wires here, we use interoperative monitoring, so we can monitor the function of the facial nerves. Uh, he has no functional hearing, but for a tumor this size, we know that it's basically impossible to preserve functional hearing. <clears throat> but that was not the main goal of surgery. The main goal of surgery was to remove as much as you can of the tumor tissue and also to preserve the function of his facial nerve on that side. Another, uh, another uh, option uh, when you're treating vestibular schwannomas is one of the options that I was also uh, heavily trained to, to do, which is therapeutic radio surgery. In one of our sister hospitals in Northern Worcester Hospital, we have this technology called gamma knife radio surgery. And this is a very good option for tumors like these ones that you see here in the bottom that are small. You see that there is no uh, mass effect on the brainstem or the fourth ventricle. These are small tumors, T1, T2, okay? So for these small tumors, stereotactic radio surgery, which is a single fraction delivery of focal, focal radiation only to the tumor target. And this has a very good tumor control rate. Uh, over 95% of these tumors don't grow in around 15, 20 years after this treatment. So it is a very good option to stop tumor from growing, small tumors, and sometimes patients who can't actually go and have surgery because of all the medical comorbidities, right? So this is definitely something that if you are dealing with skull-based tumors, the schwannomas, you should be aware and you should be comfortable in doing it because it's here to stay. It's a technology that was developed way back ago, but, uh, back in the day by Dr. Lars Laxell, <clears throat> but uh, he have had a lot of improvement in the technology <clears throat> recently. And this is a, an example from patients that I did here in Northern Rochester Hospital. We applied this frame to the patient's head with local anesthetic. It's not a, that uncomfortable as you may think by looking at it, okay, if you apply with the correct technique. So the patients go inside this machine here and they get the, the radiation treatment delivered. The frame provides a stereotactic uh, uh, environment. It provides a, a stereotactic space for the computer to shoot radiation to the target that you want, okay? This is very, very effective treatment options for small vestibular schwannomas. And also you, you can do this in single fraction, as I said, or in multiple sessions. That's when we call fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy. And, and, and this is just a, a, a paper showing that 
the efficacy of steratacrylate surgery and fractionated steratacrylate surgery of steratacrylate therapy to treat this type of tumors. They are both non-invasive treatment alternatives for patients with vestibular schwannomas with low rates of treatment failure. Uh, okay, and this selection of patients here that they show that the progression-free survival rates were on the order of 90 to 100% for both treatment options. So it is a very effective way of treating these patients for the right uh, uh, patient candidates, right? So as a conclusion, I just wanted to emphasize that the most important thing for everybody there at this point is not to try to learn everything about the solution hormones, but the most, my, my main job here is just to, as one of the, 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 the main goals of Lennox series neurosurgery is to inspire people. And I, I wanted to uh, conclude this talk with some of uh, things that inspired me in the past. Uh, this is a guy that I followed for since the, his early days in basketball. For people who, who, who know me, I used to be a basketball player. I played for over 15 years, almost went pro in Brazil. Um, but uh, Kobe Bryant, I followed him since he was actually 15 years old. Unfortunately, he died early this year. But he was very inspirational. He was a very hard worker guy, a great dad. And a, you can see he in his, his, his quote, I think it's one of the things that you should take for your life. Great things come from hard work and perseverance uh, and no excuses. Don't, don't look for excuses. Just work hard every day, be perseverant. Because I really do believe that talent is overrated. Okay. And if you put the work, you will you'll get what you want at some point. But also, don't keep bumping your head against the wall. Perseverance can also be overrated. And so if you see that the way you're trying to do things is not going well, don't keep bumping your head against the wall. You're gonna get a concussion, concussion instead of anything else, okay? Uh, uh, and so what I think, one of the things that I learned in my life, and uh, this is one of my favorite uh, movies of all time, Dead Poet Society. And so this is a very uh, inspirational part of the movie that I, I try to pass along. I think uh, we must constantly look at things in a different way. So if you're not being successful in, in that way, <clears throat> just try to stop stand on the, on the table and try to look at things in a different way, you may find a different solution. This is a very inspirational part of the movie that I always like to, to quote in some of my talks. I stand up <clears> at <throat> my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at different things in a different way. Uh, also, one of my favorite uh, actors here that unfortunately is not with us anymore. And with that, I hope I was a little bit inspirational for you all and help you achieve whatever you want to achieve in life. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, Dinoa. Thanks so much, man. We open, have you guys been taking questions or you want to open it up just, now? I just opened the chat. Oh, great. So I did, Danilo, you know, I agree with you about the talent thing. Um, it's overrated. I tell people all the time, you know, this is, uh, right. for me, it's, it's always been about just working hard. And, you know, if you can work harder than 95% of the people around you, you're going to be successful. I agree, man. I agree, Randy. That's been my experience as well. Yeah. So, hear the chat. acoustic, acoustic neuromas, vestibular schwannomas. <laughs> These are actually some of my favorite cases. Um, yeah, as I showed the case that we did together. Yeah, yeah I think the, the, the important thing is understanding the, the impact that um, a facial nerve palsy can have on a patient, right? And point. understanding that yeah. with advances in, in gamma knife radio surgery that, you know, we can preserve that facial function, keep people smiling 
and uh, and not having to deal with you know people staring at their face or you know the cosmetic issues that come from that, the confidence issues that people deal with. And so we're able to safely debulk a tumor, take it off the brainstem, preserve the facial nerve function, um, and essentially you know make it so that a person only has to have one surgery, hopefully in their lifetime. Uh, it's pretty incredible. It speaks to the advances in neurosurgery. Did you talk a little bit about um, your uh, journey to, to Lennox? All right, I will. So I, I did my neurosurgery residency in Brazil from 2006 to 2011 in Recife, my hometown, in this uh, very big hospital there. We do like uh, over 3,000 cases a year, Hospital de Restauração which is a hostel, which is a hostel from the University of Pernambuco. Okay, so I was there until 2011. I came, after I finished my training, I came to, to the US. Everybody who comes to the US, you have your, uh, we call like your birth, your birth date. That's when you got, when you get here. So I got here on, on February 7th, 2011. And until this day, me and my wife, we always celebrate February 7th, 2011. We always have like a little party ourselves. So I got here on, and then I started doing research at Cornell uh, with, with, uh, with a, in the skull base lab there with Dr. Bernardo and Dr. Schwartz. So I spent like a couple of years there. And then I moved to Cleveland where I spent another four years as a clinical fellow in those areas that I showed there, functional surgery, uh, brain tumors, radio surgery, and skull-based surgery. After that, I was able to, to, to go, come back and, and move to New York again. Uh, and I, I've, I had a very um, uh, a short stay in a different system. And then I moved to Lenox Hill, like almost a year and a half ago, thanks to Dr. Langer. We had a very good discussion about the opportunities at Northwell and Lennox Hill and Dr. Langer, uh, uh, Dr. Bukvar, they were very inspirational as they usually are. Everybody knows that now, it's out there. So I, I joined them and we decided to, to kind of uh, uh, expand the neurosurgery excellence from Lennox Hill here in Westchester. And then I had the pleasure to finally meet you last year and now I have a really good partner, young like me, and I'm very happy to be in the Lennox Hill and here in West, in West Chester under, under Northwell. I think we're doing a great job, but it's oh, yeah. like a, a big journey. If you put together, basically, I think like 15, 16 years to get to where I am. But I yeah, think but it's not like that for everybody in medicine. Everybody has a long journey. Right. So it is what it is. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that are key here is, I, I don't know if you know the, the up-to-date numbers, Danilo, but we have, you know, over 15,000 enrolled from over 75 countries or so, it's almost amazing. 80 countries. And we get a lot of students asking about, you know, you know, people want to come here to practice medicine and get involved in medicine and get into residency. And, you know, you're yes. someone who actually, who actually made that a reality. So exactly. uh, what kind of advice for those students do you have? You know, how did, how did your path work out the way it worked out? That's a very good question. I think the most important thing is for you to plan yourself ahead of time. If you do have time to plan yourself, okay, if you are in medical school, that's the best time to do that. So the way, the easiest and the most formal pathway to do it is when you're in medical school, you apply for internship here, and then you come to do rotation in the last year of your medical school. And when you do that, then things are gonna flow in a much easier fashion. And during your medical school, you should take the USMLE, right? The United States Medical License Exam. So when you come to do your rotation, you already have that done. So as, as if you have the mindset of exploring the world and coming here from the beginning uh, of your medical school, then things are gonna be much easier. It should take you your United States, your USMLE uh, tests, get be done with that then in your last year you'd come here do rotations in any in any area that you are interested in uh, any place it's a big country you will for sure find somebody that will will give you an opportunity if it's 
difficult is keep trying, keep trying. And then once you come here, you do the rotations and then you follow the path for the residency application, which will be basically the same one that every American graduate follows. That's the best way of doing it. Uh, uh, if you want to, if you have the opportunity and create the circumstances that you can come here and do your medical school here, then it's even better because then you're going to be like a, any other American graduate and your path is going to be, the pathway for practicing here is going to be even smoother. And, but, and, but if you already finish your training in any area, neurosurgery or internal medicine, what you can do, you can, you can do what I did. You can take this, the, the Yosemite steps later and then fight your way back. You just will need to redo your training basically again. Just be patient, uh, be focused on what you, what you want. As Langer says, keep your eyes on the boat and then you're just gonna need to do it again. It's gonna take some time and patience from your part, but it can be done. What one man can do, another can do. That's another line from one of my greatest actors, uh, Anthony Hopkins. So what one man can do, another can do. And you just, just put, your, put your effort and you can do it. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what you need to do. I'm very happy to help anybody that wants to get more advices, more specific advices. I have my social media there. Uh, I'm very happy to help. I, I, yeah, I think I think that's super, super useful. Um, someone asked uh, if you use um, ENT regularly for these approaches. Great question. Every time that I did trans lab approaches, always with ENT for the trans lab approaches. We we did that in training and the ones that I don't do a lot of trans lab because uh, I, as you are an expert on this as well. The small tumors, I usually do trans lab if there's no facial, if there's no uh, hearing already there. Small tumors, intracanalicular, or a little bit going to the cistern. These tumors can be treated also with stereotactic radio surgery. So, and because the main problem with stereotactic radio surgery for the students there is that down the road, eight, 10 years, at some point you will lose hearing. But if the patient already doesn't have hearing, so my main problem about stereotactic radio surgery is already gone, right? So for these patients, uh, unless they're very young, which usually and it's not my, my, my experience, for these patients, usually I just, I recommend stereotactic radio surgery, which I think is a great option, right, Randy? Yeah, it's super, yeah. super rare, I think, nowadays. And you know, you, I mean, you know, I trained at, at Columbia with, um, exactly, with a, big group a guy named Mike Sisti, who's probably, you know, one of the uh, best surgeons no one's ever heard of. And uh, yeah. he's, uh, you know, a huge vestibular schwannoma practice. It's a huge part of what yeah. he does. And we've, uh, you know, I never saw a trans lab. Um, we did everything yeah. retro sig, and it was because yeah. he really only did acoustics if they grew bigger than two and a half centimeters. Yeah. Everything else was treated by stereotactic radio surgery. Radio surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And with fantastic outcomes. I think the difficult cases are the ones where there's, you know, involved with NF2 or some sort of genetic predisposition to growing these tumors. Yes. Um, uh, and then also, which always has to be taken into account, you know, these tumors present to ENT first a lot of times. Yes, and so if exactly. the ENT is involved, you know, the, the, the ENT doctor does like to drill the canal. They do like to do different approaches. They're trained a little bit different for this. And yeah. so you can do it safely as long as you're trained. Um, yeah. But if they come to us, you know, typically you know, in a collaborative, you know, institution, you have the ENT doctor help you with your retro sig and you can take out the tumor together. We redo the tumor portion and they do the approach portion. But um, as part of our training, you don't need that at all. I think uh, yeah. retro sig is the workhorse of uh, the posterior fossa for neurosurgeons. So I agree. Cool surgeons. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, what else? What else do we have? We got a bunch of questions coming in here. Does anyone have any questions about the about schwannomas? These are I, again, if you get a chance to see um, neurosurgery, uh, you know, once this whole COVID nightmare is over, these are fantastic cases. I mean, you're looking yeah. around the cerebellum, you're seeing all the lower cranial nerves, which is you know incredibly beautiful, and um, and the technique involved in these is is critical too, with debulking exactly. the tumor and then pulling it off the brainstem. 
you know, it's not every day we get to do benign tumors. Exactly. Right? And yes. so when you, when you can have yeah. a good outcome, uh, it just makes the job better. Exactly. I agree. Let's see. What about, uh, did you already cover what precautions you take to cover the, to protect the facial nerve? Yeah, as we talked about it. We do the intraoperative monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. We, as uh, Stalin, then we use intraoperative electrodes and we monitor the facial, we, as facial nerve is responsible for your, our smile, right? For them to understand easy, these, all these muscles that I'm using now, uh, we, in my face, this is facial nerves, my eyebrows, the smile. And so we monitor, we put electrodes here in the face, in the muscles. So when we're doing surgery, we stimulate interoperate the nerve to make sure that things are working. And by doing that, we are able to preserve the nerve. And then we remove the tumors around the nerve because the seventh and the eighth cranial nerve is, of course, together, right, into the internal auditory canal. So we work around the seventh nerve, removing tumor, but it's stimulating, it's stimulating in a repeated fashion, the facial nerve to make sure that it's working still. That's basically how we do it. And that's the most safest way. I think it's like standard of care in the US. I don't think anybody's doing you know, civil autonomous surgery surgery without monitoring their facial nerve. You agree, Randy? Some other Yeah, I don't think so. But here, I don't think that happens anymore. Some people still do it seated though, um, which I find mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, you know, I, don't, I know you do yours in the lateral position or at least with a head turn. Um, some yeah. people still sit the patient up and operate, you know, from the back here. Exactly, seating position, right? Yeah. It's interesting. You know, in the old days, this was a, uh, you know, you did your craniotomy and just put your finger in there and tried to pluck it out. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I actually had a picture from an old book. I could, I should have put it in there, but that's a good point. <laughs> so, uh, people want to know, are you doing any research right now? Right now, um, my main focus is building up the program in Westchester. I'm slowly getting back to my, my research activities. We have like uh, some case reports that we're working on with some of the brain interns. And, uh, but I'm, I'm planning to get back on track with that and together with you and the folks at Lennox. It's been a lot of, uh, we have been dedicating a lot of my energy here now developing the practice in Westchester, yeah. as you know. But I want to get back with my research track, getting publication. I'm very interested in, in, in outcomes type of research and also in type of uh, surgical education type of research. These are the two areas that I always wanted to dedicate myself to and trying to get in touch uh, as soon as this COVID. Right before COVID started, I was getting in touch with the, with the Scobie's Anatomy Lab at, uh, in Long Island, in, in Manhasset, to get in touch on how we, I was developing some plan, a plan to do like anatomy stuff there. I was gonna get in touch with you so we could do together. But then COVID hit and everything was put on hold because they do have a very nice school business anatomy there that we can use. But now it's a different world out there. It's a lot of yeah. virtual learning. So I'm thinking how I'm gonna adjust to that. But for sure, I want to get back on my research track and, and so forth. Virtual, virtual skull days is tough. You can't just mail yeah, people ahead. That's tough. <laughs> it doesn't go over well in the mail. And surgical, <laughs> you, you actually, I think you changed the virtual uh, uh, neurosurgery education world with these brain interns. I think this is going to be reminded forever. Everybody else is following every other institution. It's actually almost every big institution now have their own virtual webinar. But you are really the one who started, and that needs to be said. This is a very groundbreaking work, and it is a real amazing thing to see. I'm, 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 congratulations. I, this, this is I appreciate good. that, but I don't know <laughs> if I can take the credit. All this shit existed. We just used it so <laughs> and made it free. Um, what else? What about endoscopic approaches for uh, acoustics? Wow. Have you ever tried it or has anyone ever I've done it? I've never tried it. I've never tried for this. I, in the CP angle, for trigeminal neuralgia, I agree. It's a great, a great, a great approach. It's a great tool to have. But for the in my experience, I never even tried. I think it's uh, microscopic in my hands is the way to go. Some yeah. people out there are trying to do that, but 
we only see the good cases, right? And there you never see the complications and when they get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And these things can be, they can be fairly bloody. And so I don't yes. know how you, how you debulk them oh, and, yes. and safely with, with financial. And listen, people are doing it without a doubt. Um, yeah. People are pushing the envelope constantly and there's some advantages to it in terms of, you know, minimally invasiveness of the approach, but exactly. um, there's no current chemos for this. I think you already talked about this. Someone was asking about yeah, medical management. Unfortunately, no. No. What is your experience, Randy? One of the things that I used to do in fellowship, and what are your thoughts? Because there's some data, right? Some some papers out there that maybe if you put this patient on aspirin, the, the, the tumor doesn't grow. We never really tried it. I mean, we just had such we had such a regimented policy for these things, uh -huh. where it was gamma knife until two and a half centimeters, and then two and a half centimeters it was surgery and above. And the yeah. surgery was the same way every single time, you know, no, exactly. no differences with, with great yeah. outcomes. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we haven't really tried it, yeah. but hey, anything's possible. Have you done any fractionated gamma knife for these? Uh, I haven't. When I left Cleveland Clinic, they had just bought it, the, the, the Icon, which is the one that you do the fractionation. The results are basically uh, the same with less uh, chances, less risks for radiation necrosis, that's a basically, and also they don't use the frame, the head frame, you don't need that for the icon. But I haven't done it, and here I do single fraction. Here in Northern West Chess House, we have the gamma knife, the perfection. We do single fraction, frame base, instead of tachyrate the surgery. Hey, Danilo, sorry, I got to take this phone call. Um, of course. We're <laughs> great still job, working. man. Thanks so much for coming along. Hey, and, man, thank uh, you very much. Anytime. If you want to open up the chat, go for it and answer a few more questions. Otherwise, we can give everyone a bathroom break before the next lecture series. All right. So I'll chat a little bit with them here. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Uh, If you scroll up a little bit in the chat, there were a lot of like questions earlier around like 1040. Wow. How many students today, Josh? That's amazing. We have 1700 right now. Wow. That's amazing, man. Uh, let me see. Let me send my email. Send Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a less smart cell phone by any chance? Wow, it's a lot of stuff, right, Josh? Yeah. Uh, people are hungry for knowledge. That's nice, man. Uh, let me see. Thank you. Uh, Work-life balance, how are you able to build a family with I'll such a demanding you. career? Thank you. You can do it. You just need to, to when, you're, when you're with your, I think the way I do it, when you're, when you're with your family, you're with your family. But as a doctor and if you are, if you are doing areas that it requires to be available at all times, which is the area that I do. So it's just, it, it comes with the territory. It is what it is. So you dedicate your life with your family, but you also have to keep one eye in the ball and one eye in the, in the basket, as we used to say in basketball. So you just need to be a type of a multitask personality so you can do it 
you, you can still do it. It is very important. A family is the most important thing. That's why I had my the picture with my with my family there in the, in the end. Everything that we do, we do for them. So you gotta keep them uh, happy, and you gotta be happy with them. But you can do it. You just but the other thing is that when you're you are with them, just make sure that you know that you are always available to them. How do you keep your imagination and perspective on the future optimistic? That's an interesting question. Very thoughtful. I'm an opti opti optimistic guy by nature. That's, that's how I am. So I like to think that things will always work in the end and just keep trying, keep working hard. I think it comes from my basketball background. We in basketball, my coach used to teach us to play the game until the end. The game is never over until it really ends it, right? So always play hard and play like it's in the first minute of every game. The, the, the score is always 0-0. Zero, zero. You're never up, you're never down. Just play hard like it's just the beginning of the game. I think that's how this got very stuck into my mind and that's how I approach life, basically. Uh, really nice, nice quotes here by Michael Down. What was your goal once in New York? Did you always envision yourself in the position you are now? Very good question. That accounts for, I can relate that to that last slide that I presented. My goal was to get a really good job to be a neurosurgeon here in the US. And of course, if possible in New York, I wanted to be a dedicated brain tumor surgeon with the training that I had but uh, uh, you have to adapt, okay? The word, the word for the 21st century is to adapt. You have to adapt yourself to different scenarios and don't just find excuses if you don't get what you want right away. Just keep working, adapt yourself. If things are not working one way, try to see things on a different angle and adjust and adapt in order to make uh, uh, things happen for you. And right now I have more of a comprehensive role than I actually thought I would have. I, and, and that's good, I like that. I'm learning different things on a daily basis and that's how life is. It's a continuous learning process and, and, and that's how it is. Someone asked, maybe you want to touch on this, about like cases you had that didn't go well and how you learn from these experiences and how you move on from them. Uh, are there any cases that you had that didn't go well and how did you learn? All right, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, every neurosurgeon, every doctor had cases that didn't go well. The one that tells you that if there's a doctor that tells that you never had a case that didn't go, that <clears throat> didn't go well, Right there, you, you look into somebody who's lying. That's a liar right there. Everybody has cases that didn't go well. And that's unfortunately the nature of this business. You just need to be a humble person, a humble guy. Talk to the family. Try to learn from your mistakes. And make sure that you're transparent. You have to know how to say, I'm sorry, that things didn't go well. Although you tried the best that you could, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or a bad doctor. It's just the nature of our, our job. Sometimes in medicine, you do everything the right way and things doesn't work and things, doesn't, and things don't, don't work well in the end. 
It's just the nature of what we do. You're still a good doctor, you're still a good person, but at that day, you just, you lost that game. Even Michael Jordan, who was a best player, he played great games and he lost games. Okay, so that happens, unfortunately. In our, in our uh, line of business, unfortunately, patients die, right? And of course, I had that happen to me. And, uh, but there's, it's always a learning point. So you're always learning. If you meet a neurosurgeon who tells you, if you see somebody who tells you that, oh, I already know everything. So he shouldn't be practicing anymore. And I don't believe that person exists. We are, we are learning on the fly here all the time. We're learning more and more on each day, on a daily basis, on each case, there's always something to learn. That's a good advice also for anything that you're doing in your life. Try to learn one, at least one new thing every day. In the end of every year, you're gonna have like 265 new things in your, in your armamentarium, right? Well, thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you, Josh. Speaking. Always happy to be part of this, man. You guys are doing a, such a great job. This is, for me, this is a revolutionary virtual educational thing, and it's really amazing to see. Thank you thank very you. much, man. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye, guys.